before you came, and it was just one problem after another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't wear belts. <laughs> ladies to women and uh, I like to free women from bondage that they are under and they are un under bondage also in Christianity I have to say that and, and I don't mean it badly and when I say that I am a believer in equality of women I get accused sometimes that uh, I am a feminist and I guess I would say I am a feminist, I'm a Christian feminist, because I believe that Jesus himself, and Apostle Paul even, was a feminist. I do believe that. And why do I say that? Because I did my research. I, was, uh, I went into Greek language, and privately, I'm not a scholar in Greek. If you want to call me scholar, then call me scholar music theory, because I understand music theory well. I was teaching it at college at one point. So yes, okay, we can speak about music history theory, but as far as Greek, my passion and my passion for Christ since the day that he came for me, I really needed to know my own identity as a woman. How God views me and how does he think about me? Because in Watchtower, uh, men have told me that my spiritual husband are basically elders in a congregation. They didn't tell me my spiritual husband is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It was men that were my spiritual husbands. And uh, I was supposed to be under obedience to these men. And these men were taking me very wrong direction. And I gave them my trust because they brainwashed me in believing that they are my husbands. I mean, spiritual guidance. And, and I believed it from all of my heart until the day that Jesus came to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when he came, he freed me. Amen. And the bondage left me. And I knew that all I need is Christ. And we as women are definitely not under men. We are under Christ. Amen. Amen. And I am trying to tell this to ladies. Even after leaving Watchtower, I went to many churches. I did get baptized in one non-denominational church, which that was a completely awesome day. And I'll never forget that day of my baptism in that church. However, that particular church also believed that women are under guidance, spiritual guidance of men. But I truly do not believe we are under men. We are, we are definitely under Jesus Christ. And I'm trying to call women to understand that there are men maybe in a false religion. I mean, my ex-captors were definitely in false religion. They were all men. It's a male-dominated cult. And they were taking me wrong direction, wrong way. And it was blind leading the blind. And we know that they're going and where they're going, the Watchtower leadership. They're taking people away from Jesus. So when people say that I'm a feminist, I want to make sure that you guys understand the difference between Christian feminism and, and, uh, and pagan feminism. Just like this, everything is good or bad. The feminism can be good or bad. And uh, in Christian feminism, we're just bringing women back to their place next to men as equals. In pagan feminism, we bring women above men. We speak badly about men. We look down on pagans. This is, this is pagan feminism. We have nothing to do with this. In Christianity, we believe that men and women are equally fallen and they're equally redeemed by one master, yes. and that master is Jesus. Yes. So, but anyway, I hope I entertained you in the meantime. Yes. <laughs> Would you like to now? As you're going along, you mm -hmm. saw you have to sit the air for each time you want to change. And you'll come up here. So. Okay. Now, this is just a little introduction for, uh, my husband will take over pretty soon because he knows more on the biblical side of things, I did a lot of research. Will Antichrist be the Muslim? Yes. Now, if you lived 100 to 500 years ago, this question would have no meaning for you at all. 
or you would answer this question with a resounding no. Why? Because Christians of the past, they knew the identity of the man of sin, and they knew that he is already among them. We are all waiting for one man to come, a mysterious man to come, but maybe we forgot that he's already here, and he has been here. And yes, there will be one last Antichrist, the one last man. But the Antichrist is being here even at the time of Paul, that he already said that he's already here. And he was prophesying of times, of very dark times coming ahead. Now notice what some of the Christian leaders of the past said, and they had no doubt in their mind who the Antichrist is, okay? And please forgive me some of my English mispronunciations. I, I will try my best. John Wycliffe, is that the right way to say that? Okay. When the Western Church was divided for about 40 years between two rival popes, one in Rome and the other in Avignon, France, each pope called the other pope Antichrist. And John, John Wycliffe is reputed to have regarded them as both as being right. <laughs> Two halves of Antichrist making up the perfect man of sin between them. <laughs> Martin Luther. Who doesn't know Martin Luther? You all know Reformation? Yes. Okay. We are here, well, we, we here are of the conviction that the papacy is the seed of the true and real Antichrist. That's what he said. Personally, I declare that I owe the Pope no other obedience than that to Antichrist. Taken from the, well, it's taken from the prophetic faith. I'm not going to uh, give you my uh, sources. Please just read them out there, okay? I despise and attack it as impious, false. It is Christ himself who is condemned the reign. I rejoice in having to bear such ills for the best of causes. Already I feel greater liberty in my heart. For at last I know that the Pope is Antichrist and that his throne is that of Satan himself. Uh, Mr. Catherine Mather, uh, Ma 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 Mather, maybe? It was a congregational theologian. I have problems with English names, so forgive me. The oracles of God foretold the rising of an Antichrist in a Christian church. And in the Pope of Rome, all the characteristics of that Antichrist are so marvelously answered that if any who read the scriptures do not see it, there is a marvelous blindness upon them. Mr. John Wesley, Methodist. Speaking of the papacy, he said he's an emphatical sense, the man of sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure, and he is too properly styled the son of perdition, as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both, both of his opposers and followers. He it is that exalts himself about all that is called God, or that is worshipped, claiming the highest power and highest honor, claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone, and that's true. Because if you look at the, uh, the, the flag of Vatican, what do you see on it? You see a triple crown with two keys. So you know what these two keys represent? They represent his political power, called also temporal power, and his spiritual power. It's not because he has that power, but he does have it from Satan. He has it from devil. Yeah. But for us, he doesn't have it. He certainly doesn't have spiritual power over me. That's right. And we will see, because I brought you some other things here for you to see how Pope calls himself and how bishops call him and how Catholic world actually looks at him. Thomas Cranmer, Anglican. Whereof it follows Rome to be the seat of Antichrist and the Pope to be very Antichrist himself. I mean, these are men of God. These are men that make differences in this country. They, they cause their formation. I could prove the same by many other scriptures, old writers and strong reasons. That's what he said. Roger Williams, first Baptist pastor in America, he says, he spoke of the Pope as the pretended biker or vicar, how would you say that? Vicar. 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 Okay. He spoke of the Pope as the pretended vicar of Christ on earth, who sits as God over the temple of God, exalting himself not only about all that is called God, but over the souls and consciences of all his vassals, yet over the spirit of Christ, over the Holy Spirit, yet and God himself. 
speaking against the God of heaven, thinking to change times and laws, but he is the son of perdition. Yeah. In 1960, 1689 London Baptist Confession on chapter 26 of the church, they said, the Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church in whom by the appointment of the Father, all power for the calling, institution, order, or government of the church is invested in a supreme and sovereign manner. Neither can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, the man of sin and son of perdition, that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. John Knox, Scotch Presbyterian pastor. Knox wrote to abolish the tyranny which the people himself has for so many ages exercised over the church and that the Pope should be recognized as the very Antichrist and son of perdition of whom Paul speaks. John Calvin, he was also Presbyterian. Some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman Pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt. I shall briefly show that in Paul's words in Thessalonians 2, are not capable of any other interpretation than that which applies them to papacy. Matthew 24, 24 reads, and we know it, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. Okay. Perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Every single pope has carried a title of vicar of Christ on earth. The verse in Matthew 24, 24 is a prophetic verse that applies to the dynasty of popes of Rome. The verse is fulfilled in popes of Rome. The Roman Catholic Church has always claimed to be walking with Christ. Just as Judas kissed the Christ, so has Rome kissed his truth. They softly and gently send their walls forward bearing a clothing of a little lamb so as to gentle draw the masses away from Christ. They betray Christ as soft as the kiss of Judah, right? You know, somebody tells me, well, though, is an Antichrist is supposed to be against Christ. That's like Muslims. Muslims hate Christ. They're a typical Antichrist. But how does how does Pope denies the Father and the Son? Did you ever think about it? Because with his mouth, he proclaims them, doesn't he? He has a mask of Christianity. He's that lamb, always dressed in white. He looks evil, though. Look at him. Look at him. Right. Look at us. So, Paul denies the father by bringing a religion of a mother, cult of Mary. They're worshipping Mary. They're praying to her. They have her as a mediator between men and God, right? Yes, it's a worship of Mary. It's a cult of Mary, dressed as Christianity. Mm -hmm. He also usurps the title of a father. Don't you know that all the politicians of the world call him Holy Father? Right. Yeah. Yes. That's, right. That's a blasphemy. Yes, yes. it is. That's, yes. That's, right. That's right. Now, how does he deny the son? He says that the church is... Right, that's one thing. But he also says the church is built on the rock. But which rock? He says the church is built on the rock of Peter. Yeah. Don't we know who our rock is? Because yeah. Apostle Amen. Paul, he identified Amen. that rock. The church is built on the rock who is Yeshua. Christ, Yeshua, Yeshua. Yes. not Peter. <laughs> what does the word antichrist mean? It's taken from the Greek word antichristo. It actually means in translation to stand in a place of someone, to be a substitute, 
Then Bible speaks of false Christ shall come, and Jesus is uh, saying this prophecy, many false Christ shall come after me, and they're going to say, I am the Christ. He was prophesying of popes of Rome. False Christ in, in uh, Greek means actually pseudo, Christo, pseudo, which means instead of or a fake Christ, pseudo Christ. And Jesus was saying, many of them will come after me, and they're going to say, I am the Christ. And that's exactly what they're saying. And I will have very soon here all these quotations for you. Uh, just a second, because I made this little note before I move on. Okay, just to give you a little word study. The, the word Antichrist is made up of two words, anti and Christ, Antichrist. And in classical Greek, the word designates substitute, as I said. Anti or anti has same meaning as English term vice, like vice president, vice, okay. Antichrist and vicar of Christ are actually synonyms. They're synonyms. Okay, let me move on. Here's this, I brought up the Strong's Concordance for you, just to see the original word there in Greek, antichristos, and definition is someone who puts himself in the place of. So every time you see Pope of Rome and his faithful Catholics that gather in Vatican, they are all proclaiming him to be the car of Christ. They are basically saying, this man here is here instead of our Jesus. That's what they're saying. Since the very definition of the word antichrist describes a man who is claiming to be here on earth as vicar of Christ or instead of Christ or God himself, because we know Jesus is who? Yeshua is God. Okay? He's pretending to be gentle, dressed in white, preaching peace and love. You must understand that the idea of Muslim Antichrist is absolutely impossible. Why? Muslims worship Allah. Their ideology is Islam. And Muslim would never claim to be God on earth, as this particular statement, so typical for Antichrist, would be a blasphemy in Muslim religion. Taken from the Quran 379, it is not possible for any human being unto whom Allah has given the scripture and wisdom and the prophethood that he should afterwards have said unto mankind, be slaves of me instead of Allah. But what he said was, be ye faithful servants of the Lord by virtue of your constant teaching of the scripture and of your constant study thereof. Man was never, is never, and will be never God, Allah. Because man and God, Allah have different qualities and attributes. Prophet Jesus was a man, not God. This is what, what the Muslims believe. And if any Muslim today has declared that he is God in flesh, or vicar of, God, of Christ, or antichrist, which is vicar of Christ and antichrist are, are basically synonyms, there would be a fatwa against him. There would be a holy war. It's completely against their religion. They do not believe man can be God or instead of God here on earth. So this, there is a problem. They don't even have an image. No image. Right, exactly. Okay, now we're going to go to all these quotations. I'll be reading them. Uh, how is Pope perceived by people and even by Pope themselves? Popes themselves. These words appeared in the Roman canon law. To believe that our Lord God the Pope has not the power to decree as he de his decree is to be deemed heretical. There are the sources. Some Father Perea, a Catholic priest, says, it is quite certain that popes have never approved or rejected this title, Lord God the Pope. For the passage in the gloss referred to appears in the edition of the Canon Law published in Rome in 1580 by Gregory the 13th. And let me tell you, they have never canceled it, never changed it. This is the actual document where they said they're God, uh, Lord God the Pope. In, uh, in their favorite language, which is Latin, Dominum Deum Nostrum Papam. It seems that Pope John Paul II now presides over the universal church from his place upon Christ's cross. 
said Alcon Bishop. The Pope is of the great dignity and so exalted that he's not a mere man, but as it were God and vicar of God. These are quotations. <coughs> All names which in the scriptures are applied to Christ, by virtue of which it is established that he is over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope, said authority councils, book 2, chapter 17. The Pope and God are the same, so he has all power in heaven and earth, So the Pope Pius V. The Pope is, as it were, God on earth sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief of kings, having plenitude of power. And these are your sources right there. You can go yourself, look them up. The Pope takes the place of Jesus Christ on earth. By divine right, the Pope has supreme and full power in faith, in morals, over each and every pastor and his flock. Don't we know this to be true, though? Do you know ecumenical movement today? Do you know that Almost all denominations at the head, at the, where the power is, at the headquarters, have joined in with the Pope. That's right. So yeah, he definitely has uh, full power over them. Now I'll continue the quote. He is the true vicar, the head of the entire church, the father and teacher of all Christians. Is he your teacher? No. no. He is the infallible ruler, the founder of dogmas, the author of and the judge of councils, the universal ruler of truth, the arbiter of the world, the supreme judge of heaven and earth, the judge of all being judged by no one, God himself on earth. This is quoted in New York Catechism. Does it hurt to say all that? Does it, hurt to it does, but I'm just bringing it to you. I, I, I'm bringing it out. Because the Antichrist is among us. You're going to see him in September mm. in yes. your country. Hopefully yes. not. And that was not supposed to that wasn't supposed to happen. What happened to Christian people? Why are they allowing this in their country? Bad, bad. <laughs> you know, from my research I know that if a Pope puts his foot on a land he claimed that that's his land because if he didn't conquer it, he doesn't put his foot on that land. Am I right, brother? You know that. Well, he's coming to your country in September because he conquered your land. Because he runs this country. He thinks. All right, let's keep going in our sources here. Writers on the canon law say the Pope and God are the same, so he has all power in heaven and earth. Oh, really? Pope Nicholas first declared that the appellation of God has been confirmed by Constantine on the Pope, who being God cannot be judged by man. Oh my goodness. I don't know if you are aware of one thing. The Pope has total and absolute immunity. Did you know that? Immunity from the law. That's right. He's a giver of law, but she, he shall not be judged by that law. That means that if the Pope has committed any crimes, any, yes. any, Murders. like, um, what are his latest crimes? Well, uh, yes. Right, right, okay, very, very ugly crimes. You know he has a total immunity, there's nothing that will happen to him. Nothing. He's, He's above the law. Why? The Pope is of the great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man. He is, as it were, God on earth, sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief of kings, having plenitude of power. The supreme teacher in a church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds thereof requires complete submission and obedience of will to the church and to the Roman pontiff, as, as to God himself said Leo VIII in his encyclical letter. Okay, now complete submission, obedience, what does it remind you of? Islam. Islam, Sharia law. Mm -hmm. Sharia law is nothing but canon law. Sharia law is a Roman canon law. Yes. When they're saying that they're using Muslim people who are for most part quite peaceful, you know? Yes, they are. But they're, they're, they're creating those radicals and they're using Muslim people as their army. They're using them, so our attention goes on Islam and Muslim people. So 
we have not at our attention on the real source of, of trouble. And this was what happened to many Christian pastors in America. They are telling their flock that the Antichrist will be Muslim. Because there is such a thing like Loyola Army. Brother, you want to come say it? I'm, I'm the Jesuits. <laughs> you were supposed to have Alan Laman on, but he's, yeah. again, nobody knows where the brother is. We're kind of worried about him. But uh, he has his army, Jesuit army, who are infiltrated churches, schools, organizations, food and drug administration, you name it. Everything governmental out there is infiltrated by schools. Yes, everything is infiltrated by Jesuits. And it's been happening for about 100 years now, something like that, very successfully in the United States of America. And in a lot of churches, when you guys go and you think I'm a Protestant Christian, you think you're Protestants. Well, some of your pastors are actually Jesuits or they are being taught by infiltration uh, by Jesuits and they are taking this um, attention of people to a Muslim Antichrist. Okay. Antichrist cannot be Muslim. That goes against his very religion of Islam. They don't go together. All right, where was I? The, did I read? Okay, next one. Sorry. Um, hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown, as king of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. That's why the triple crown on his flag. And the two keys, as I said, it's, he claims he has a political power and, and religious power. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, he's Jesus Christ himself, oh. hidden under the veil of flesh, said the Catholic National Magazine. Behold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. This is spoken by Pope himself, Pope Leo XIII. For thou art the shepherd, thou art the physician, thou art the director, thou art the husbandman. Finally, thou art another God on earth. Another quotation by history of councils. The Pope is the supreme judge of the law of the land. Well, he is kind of. He is the resurgent replacement of Christ, who is not only a priest forever, but also king of kings and lord of lords. Not my king of kings, not my lord of lords. And you know, they call him priest forever. Do you know that Jesus is a high priest? Yes. In the yes. order of Melchizedek? Yes. yes. Yeah, so the pseudo Christ or false Christ will also be a priest, but the false one. Yeah, Well, what more do you need to believe the dynasty of Pope is Antichrist? Okay, some more quotations. This is our last lesson to you. Receive it, engrave it in your minds, all of you. By God's commandment, salvation is to be found nowhere but in the church. The strong and effective instrument of salvation is none other than the Roman pontificate. The Pope takes the place of Jesus Christ on earth by divine right. The Pope has supreme and full power in faith in morals over each and every pastor and his flock. He is the true vicar, the head of the entire church, the father and teacher of all Christians. He is the infallible ruler, the founder of dogmas, the author of the judge of counsel, the universal ruler of truth, the arbiter of the world, the supreme judge of heaven and earth, the judge of all, being judged by no one, God himself on earth. This is from New York Catechism. Well, let me just cite this scripture uh, in opposition to the Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself about all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And I just proved it to you. He's showing himself to be God and people who follow this are guilty of the same thing. Okay, I'm going to go just into more of the reasons of why the, the Antichrist can be a Muslim, and then I'll give the word more to my husband because he knows more of the biblical side of things. Paradigm shift has been injected into the Christian church about Antichrist thinking. Guys, we have forgot reformation. We forgot what has happened. We forgot that 150 million saints have been killed. That's 
They've been tortured the most terrible ways. I've been thinking if I should put, you know, in Prague we went to this museum of Inquisition and they were these instruments of torture. And it's three, um, three levels of them. We had three stories big. And then I was just, we were there like two hours because I was looking at each one and I couldn't comprehend in my brain where did this come from? I mean, that, that had to come directly from the mind of the devil. These instruments of torture. And our dear brothers and sisters in Christ were tortured like this. And they were, they died. They, they died after they'd been tortured and, and, and humiliated. They died sometimes by burning alive. Advocates of Muslim Antichrist believe and preach that this beastly individual has Assyrian origins. The book of Daniel is considered as the most important book that reveals the identity of the Antichrist. Yet not even once it mentions the Hebrew word Ashur, which is translated as an Assyrian. The term Ashur appears in the Old Testament 135 times, but it seems that Daniel wasn't thinking of the Antichrist as an Assyrian, or else he would surely pen it down. Daniel calls this Antichrist individual by several names, like beast, representing his hostile disposition, and horn, alluding to his authority. Daniel describes that this individual will speak pompous words, and that he will declare himself about all that is called God, but still, not even once, Daniel mentions that he will be Syrian. Daniel 9.26 reads, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. This particular scripture just gave us the most literal account of the identity of this individual that is called the Antichrist. Daniel just told us that he will originate from the people who would eventually destroy the city of Jerusalem and a second Jewish temple. If you notice this, and the, and the people of the prince yeah. that shall come. Yes. According to a factual history, this already happened in 70 AD, and the Roman Empire did destroy the city of Jerusalem and the second Jewish temple under the Roman emperor and commander Titus. Amen. The book of Daniel deals with the four Gentile world empires. The Assyrian Empire has already come and gone by. The Daniel was given an interpretation of the king's dream. Do you know what was the first empire? Egypt and then Assyria, right? But by the time that, that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar received this dream, and, and it starts with Babylon, because Daniel told him, you are the head, you are that kingdom, the Babylon. We cannot speak of Assyria and Egypt that has already come and gone. We have to start with Babylon, because that's when the dream was given, okay? So we must find a clue to the Antichrist from the times of this dream and not from the empires that has already come and go. The first empire, according to the dream, was Babylon, the middle of Persia, followed by Greece, and finally comes the Rome. And as we see, even the feet are, uh, it's iron mingled with... Uh, yeah. Yes. The historic Roman Empire became divided. We had a so-called Western light of the empire and an Eastern light. Okay. The Western light of the empire eventually fell, that's true, but the Eastern light continued as the Byzantine Empire for a thousand more years with the kingdom centered in Turkey. The Ottomans conquered Byzantine Empire near the turn of the 14th century and ruled until 1920s. Because it was the Assyrian soldiers from the eastern leg of the Roman Empire that destroyed the city of Jerusalem, some theologians today have assumed that the Antichrist will be from that region of the world. And since it is Muslims today that live in that part of the world, they say that the Antichrist must come from these people. However, 
It was the Romans who wielded world authority at the time, and they issued the command to destroy Jerusalem and the Jewish temple. It wasn't Assyrian. Soldier has no power. Soldier is only man used by the certain power. All the artifacts from temple, including golden menorah, were taken to Rome. The Assyrian soldiers from the eastern leg side were subservient to the ruling kingdom and they were subjects of the Roman Empire. In this sense, even though the Roman Empire employed non-Roman soldiers within its ranks, such as defeated Assyrians, these soldiers operated solely under the command of their Roman leadership. The legions that destroyed Jerusalem didn't act on their own accord, but they acted under authority of Rome. Capital city of the Roman Empire at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem and the second Jewish temple was in Rome, which then and today is located in the western leg of the former empire. Today, the former Assyrian territory, which is Syria and parts of northern Iraq, has no Roman connection. Therefore, the Antichrist cannot come from that part of the world as he would be without Roman roots. Now, that was my part kind of uh, why we cannot have a Muslim Antichrist. For me, it's very simple because I see and I just saw the quotations who Pope claims to be. And it's how plain can he get? He says he's here instead of Christ and he's God on earth. You know, Pope is not waiting on second coming of Jesus in flesh. Did you know that? They don't say Jesus is coming back in flesh to reign as king for a thousand years. They want this kingdom. Pope right. wants to be the vicar of Christ or Christ on earth. So I hope that this helped you somehow with my research in this summary. And I'll gladly give this microphone to my husband now. <laughs> a little bit over into our little break part there, but then do a break and then we'll extend Sister Lisa's time a little bit more uh, so that we can get all of this in. Um, that was a fascinating uh, presentation, I believe, myself. That's why I say when she puts her presentations together, it's very logical um, and a blessing as well. So, amen. Um, For me, I, I hate to say that I go from a biblical standpoint, but with my wife, hers is very much in research and finding, as you saw, as she introduced to you, uh, Ethan, do we have audio back there still going on there? Um, yeah, audio's okay. fine. All right, thank you. Um, and for me, God deals with me through inspiration in the scriptures and finding these places where we can, we can see the Antichrist actually at and um, he's even revealed more to me that will actually, did I spell something wrong? I saw my wife's finger go off. I have no idea, boy. Don't even tell me. <laughs> my husband has dyslexia, okay, so I, I do have to. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, anyway, let's get off that screen. <laughs> If, they, if anything's misspelled there, that was the guy that wrote this. <laughs> okay. Anyway, though, so we're, we're still continuing on in identifying the Antichrist. And um, it, it is interesting because everyone is looking to be the Antichrist as a, as a Muslim guy. And, uh, and, and this is, I know Wally Shubat really cannot stand me whatsoever. Anybody that knows, if you know him personally, you'll know he hates me because he's made it known publicly. Uh, I was supposed to be on a radio program with him about two years ago, and I didn't know that much about him, and someone said you should go research uh, Wally Shubat, so I, we did a little bit, and then I saw he was from Muslim Antichrist, and I didn't mind going on with him still, though, but, you know, I wanted to be able to at least say what I had to say about it, 
And then I was told, you keep your mouth shut, don't say anything in contradiction with what he is saying. You're only to support what he says when you come on the program. Wow. That's the way I was told to deal with this. No. You know, and I and I told them, I said, have him call me, let, let me talk to him as a brother to a brother, because I'd like to at least express what I think before, if I'm gonna go on with him. But they would not do it. So, and because they'd already advertised this to you guys, if you were back then, you would have known, they wanted everybody to know that I was gonna be on the program with him. And then, so finally I had to make a decision. I'm not going to now say that I'm gonna be on the program. I can't let the people that are listening to our ministry just blindly go follow into this. So I exposed who he really was. You know, and, and nothing against him, but I just want to speak about it. And, uh, but anyway, so the thing is, though, there, there's a lot. The, the Catholic Church is really working very hard to make sure that the attention is taken off, taken off of them and put on someone else. This is what this is about. In fact, recently the, the, the Muslim world declared the caliphate in ISIS, and the only other time that they ever declared a caliphate in history was all the way back during the time that the Vatican created the Muslim re religion back in the fifth century, that's when they created a caliphate as well then. And of course, why? Because Rome wants the attention off of them and on someone else, because it's too obvious. If you go and you look in even the apocryphal writings, um, and I won't go into that because I can't say which ones are right or not. Uh, that's not my forte, but I find it interesting because there's one particular one that they say that Jesus wrote, and it is a 2,000 year old document, uh, so I, I give it credit for the fact that it's prophetic. They say in there that Jesus says that, speaking of Peter, he said, there will come a succession of men after you that will claim that they are of you, claim that they're actually Peter. And this was what they, this is written in the ancient document is that old, we do know that, that Jesus said to Peter, there's going to be a group of men that will come, they will actually speak as if they are of you, and he said, and the last one will be the wicked one that comes. And that's just paraphrasing it. I wish I had it before me. I'd love to read it to you again. But I didn't have the time to put that together. Maybe I can find it and I'll share it with you tomorrow. But we're seeing it. I mean, if nothing else, that's prophetic because it's exactly what Rome did. Um, Gershon Solomon was telling me when I was in Israel, um, that uh, we, last time we met together, which was about eight months ago, he told me, he said, Steve, he says, the Dead Sea Scrolls, he said, contains a lot of writings about Yeshua. And he said, and the Vatican does not want the world to know what Yeshua said. He says, because if they were to reveal it, it would totally discredit the Catholic Church as an, as an authority of Christianity. And he said, and they don't want no one knowing that. This is why back in the 40s when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in Qumran, who, got, who were they given to? Now this is kind of strange. You know, 47 to, uh, says, what, how, how many years? Were they, they collected them for like several years, correct? Mm -hmm. And then they handed them over to the Catholic Church. And the monks that were the Protestant monks that are under the Catholic Church, they were the ones that have, full, and they still have full control of all of these ancient documents. And of course, the Jews in, in the 90s, we finally got a little bit released to us, so when we get a little fragment, we're supposed to be all excited about it, you know? <laughs> the book belongs to us. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. yes. But one Jewish scholar, and God bless her heart, she spoke at a university, I was listening, you can listen to her online, and, and I'll get that information where you can listen to her, you really should listen to it. But she talks about, on there, exactly some of the things that, you know, of course, that, that what we have got to see, because they've, they've at least released the parts uh, of what was the Bible, the, 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 the Kothavim, the writings, the Navim, the prophets, and the Torah, they released a lot of that documentation that the Essene group had then, and it was um, uh, from the priests that separated from there, they took the scrolls in the desert and hid them there. But just to give you one quick little insight on that, David wrote 364 psalms. We've only got 150. Wow. According to what the scholars said, Israel did not go by a lunar calendar. That's according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. The day, there were 364 days in the year according to what is written in the Dead Sea Scrolls. A lot of this was new to me. I didn't know this until just recently as well. 
But another thing was, is she said you'd be amazed at some of the books that we don't have that were in the Dead Sea Scrolls that Isaiah said. So there's a lot of things that we don't have. And it also goes into the temple sacrifices. And according to what was in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the early Israelites did not do blood sacrifice. Now, I don't know, I'm not a scholar, but it's just interesting to see. But we can see some of this in the Torah ourselves. That seems to be contradictory in a way. So, we'll have to go to it in a little bit, sis. Anyway, so let me, let me move right down into the Antichrist part here. So, and like I said, I don't understand all this, what I'm telling you there. I'm just saying what, what she shared. You have to listen to it for yourself to see, because it's interesting. It's very interesting, to say the least. But we're missing a lot of our Bible from what they're saying that they had in uh, the in Qumran. Uh, let's look at this scripture right here. It's in uh, 1 John, and there again, this is the scripture on the Antichrist that we're normally familiar with, because in, when John writes this in 1 John, John refers to the Antichrist. But when you go to the book of Revelation where he writes, he doesn't say the word Antichrist again. We find out that he speaks about the false prophet. And I believe that it's one and the same. The only difference is, is that John is getting more revelation, perhaps, when he writes the book of Revelation, and he's seeing more of who he is, because he's like Christ. As uh, we know that the ancient, uh, and I guess if, in your presentation you had Antichristo up there, the actual ancient definitions for Antichristo being someone that, is, that takes the place of Christ, or like Christ. But now, when you look at all the commentaries and the, and the biblical dictionaries, they're changing the original meaning of Antichristo, and they're actually calling it only against, like in English, anti being against Christ. And the reason they're doing that, they don't want you to know that the Vatican is your, the, that the Pope is where the Antichrist is at. Now, the scripture says here, little children, it is the last time, it says, uh, as you have heard, that Antichrist, Notice, singular, shall come. Okay? Then it says, even now are there many antichrists, plural, whereby we know that it is the last time. And that has continued on down through times. There's always been many antichrists. But it's really interesting to watch how the scripture breaks down in this. Verse 19, they went out from us. That tells you right there, they were religious, they were believers of Yeshua, they were part of the Christian congregation, but they went out from us, like Judas. See? Judas is numbered with the 12. He was, he actually, when Yeshua sends them out to go out and to, to preach the gospel around the, the world there, of, of, the, of the known world of their time, he gave them authority to cast out devils, pray for the sick, raise the dead, etc. Judas was among them. He was among the twelve when he came back and they rejoiced and said, are not the devil subject unto us? Sure. See, he was religious. He could do miracles. And Yeshua said, rejoice not that the devils are subject unto you, but that your names are written. See, so the Antichrist, or in this case in the plural sense, because there's always been many Antichrists down through the ages, it is a religious group of people or persons that are like Christ, but they go out from you. Why? Because they don't carry the same doctrine. Now, this is one thing, and we're going to go into this tomorrow night about the two witnesses. I've always found it fascinating. You guys know, you listen all the time. Why does God have to send two witnesses? Because he can't find two Baptists. <laughs> well, they're out of the picture altogether. <laughs> And let me say this about Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't even like to call them that. I'll call them Watchtower people. Because we know that, and my sister will tell you, and I know there's a lot of people who believe, well, the name of Hashem has been restored. We still say Hashem. Zephaniah clearly declares, and this is the prophet Zephaniah, that God will restore a pure language, not just for the Jewish people, for you as well. That we all may be able to call upon the name of the Lord, that's capital L-O-R-D, which is Hashem's name, the divine name of God. See, and it even tells when. Zephaniah says that when, he come, when God has come and gathered the nations to Israel, 
for judgment, then he will restore a pure language to the people so that we may be able to worship God by his divine name. Amen. See? I believe that the two witnesses bring that divine name back. I believe that's the restoration. Because when God said to Moses, or excuse me, Moses says to God, he says, they will ask me, Mashimo, what is his name? I have not found a scripture yet where Israel ever asked God or Moses, what is his name? And it's interesting how he answers. He says, tell them, Yihaye Asha Yihaye. Yihaye is not God's name. But what is God actually saying? He, we say, I am that I am, but literally, and my sister, correct me, please, if I'm wrong, because I want to be right, I don't want to be wrong. God is really saying, I will prove to you who I am. Now later he reveals the divine name to Moses. Moshe is how we say his name. He reveals this name later, and, and, and this is interesting. Do you know when Moshe, when, the, when he brought the children of Israel down to the, to the Red Sea, Yam Suf, and by the way, Yam Suf means a sea of reeds. It doesn't mean uh, a, a sea of water or red like the color red. And if you've ever read the book that I wrote, and some people must be wondering, all right, because I don't tell nobody half the time. And I actually had three cases of books to bring here and forgot them in Fort Myers. So, unless somebody, and we know somebody's coming up from that direction, and we get them to bring them, we, I guess somebody can meet them, but uh, if not, we'll see about sending you one. But, uh, but I brought them for you guys so you would have one. But anyway, Yom Suf was the Sea of Reeds, and that was fulfilled. Because see, when Moses came down, when he brought the children down to, to, to the Red Sea, there was no reeds there. It was on the Gulf of Aqaba. This is, there is literally chariot wheels. Now I don't, I never knew Ron Wyatt, and I don't really know what Ron Wyatt teaches on most of the things that he, that he taught on, but I do believe that he was a man of God. I do believe that. I believe that he was a humble man. I met his wife. She was a very, Mary Lou, she's a very precious woman. And she allowed me to use his picture. I think I was the only one ever given the right to use it, permission to use it, on the cover of the book that I wrote, Yom Suf. But on that crossing there, he found a golden chariot wheel on the bottom. And as Ron said, it belonged to the priest. They were always the last to go in. Not like in the children of Israel. See, God was never afraid. And neither his children. The Levites went first into battle Amen. with no swords. They carried the sword with them when they went into battle. And that was the word of Almighty God. Amen. 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 So he goes down there, and according to the sages, which are the old rabbis, they said that Moshe invoked the name of God. When God said to him, why are you crying unto me? Speak and go forward. And he spoke his name. And that sea got scared and moved back. Now, Ron found when he did that, when he found the mountain, and I'm kind of getting off course here, but when he found the mountain of Sinai in Saudi Arabia, where our sister is living at now, that mountain was burnt on top. And they still don't know why it was burnt like that. His wife took a picture from the Gulf of Aqaba from the Egyptian side looking across. And I was searching the mountains by satellite, just curious, because that got me curious. I had to go look. And all of a sudden, I found down on the Gulf of Aqaba, there was a mountain burnt. And when I looked at it, it was perfectly, directly, east to west, across the Gulf of Aqaba. And then I looked at her picture, and there it is, the cap of the mountain burnt there. And um, Another sister that was involved in that project there told me, no one has ever noticed that before. I said, God sat there on that mountain. The Bible says God blew from his nostrils that wind, and it went across in part of the sea. So why did he say, though, Yom Suf? Why did he say a sea of reeds? Well, we have in Jeremiah 16, the day will come that the God of Israel, the people will no longer say the Lord lives and deliver the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But they will say the Lord lives and deliver the children of Israel from the land of the north. 
and from all other countries, whether they've been dispersed to. That's what's been happening in modern days. But you know, I caught one thing. How many people seen the movie Defiance? Just raise a hand. Anybody else ever see that movie? Daniel Craig plays Tuvia Bielski in that movie. Tuvia Bielski's oldest, or I think he's not the oldest son. No, he's the second. No, he's the oldest son. Mickey Bielski is a good friend of mine. I met him by Providence. His wife was my editor. And his father fulfilled the prophetic part when God said, from the land of the north. His father, like Moses, led the children of Israel, 1,200 of them, through the wilderness of Belarusia, Belarusia, the north country. They moved the exact number of times as Moses did in the wilderness getting to the Red Sea. Now he didn't know it, but when he got down and had no other place to go and the Germans were gonna kill them all and had them surrounded, one of the guys came up to Tuvia and said there's an island in the middle of the swamp. He said if we can get the people there, it'll be safe. He led them eight miles across a sea of reeds and they went to safety. It is eight miles across the Gulf of Aqaba where the children of Israel crossed. Moses, maybe unbeknownst to himself, was prophesying when he called it Yom Suf. They crossed the Sea of Reeds. But anyway, let's go back to the Antichrist. Because there's something really important I've got to tell you about this. Notice again in verse 18, though, it's singular. He says, and as you have heard that the Antichrist, singular, see, it's in singular, shall come. It's a future coming. Okay? And we've already talked about being a religious spirit, so let's move forward. I wanted you to look at these two scriptures here because when we're looking at an enterprise that shall come, my wife brought up the one about Daniel 9.26. So let's quickly look at this one again. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself. You know, it's actually written in the Talmud that before the destruction of the second temple, Mashiach must, for, must come. That's in our Talmud. I have the Talmud. I, did, I should have brought it with me here, but I have my own Talmud. Don't ask me if it's Babylonian or Jerusalem. I'm not going to tell you. Okay? But it says, and that the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, just quickly so you know, the one that destroyed the city of the sanctuary, as we know, was Titus. A lot of the scholars today, like my good friend Chuck Nessler, I know Chuck, we, we did a video together before, that they're trying to say that it's a, it's a Muslim Antichrist. And the reason that Chuck uses to, 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 to uh, justify this is because that during the time of the Roman Empire, the Eastern and Western leg, like my wife was saying to you a bit ago, the Eastern leg were the, were the Syrians. The only thing that people don't realize, though, are who, are the real, who really are the Romans? The Romans are Esau's children. That's according to Obadiah. And where did, how do we know this? Biblically, you can trace it. Hadad, who was the sole child that escaped the sword. He escaped the sword of David. Him and certain of, the, uh, of his servants, and they go into Egypt, and they are actually reared by the Pharaoh of Egypt, just as Moses was. He's raised up as, just like Moses was. And when he becomes of age, like Moses, he wants to go back home as well. And he says to, to the Pharaoh, I want to go home. And he says, have not I given you everything? You're, you're, you're like my own son. I've raised you as my son. He said, I know, and I appreciate that. Just paraphrasing all the story here. But he says, I want to go home. So I give him leave to go. But it's kind of ironic. Here he is, a royal seed of Esau. Remember the scripture says God loved Jacob and he hated Esau. But we never seem to find anything where Esau did anything evil to Jacob. I challenge you to find it. 
Now, he got mad at him, yeah, he had a right to be mad. He got deceived and everything else. But nowhere in the story of Esau did Esau actually do any evil to Jacob in the final days. He said, brother, live where you want to live. It was all prophetic. But Chadah, Esau's great-great-grandson, whatever he was, he comes up, he goes into Pharaoh's house, he comes out, he goes to Syria. He becomes the king of Syria. He marries in among the Syrians. Why do you think Rome has such a good relationship with the Syrians? Why do you think Basra Assad has to send a letter to the Pope and say, uh, okay, I'll surrender under these terms here. Why well, has everybody got to go to the Pope? Everybody goes to the Pope. Pope, 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 Pope. What can you do, Pope? <laughs> Just like Hezbollah said, Nasrallah Nas Nas says the other day, tells Israel well, a couple of months back, and he says, we would go to war, but we, right now we're busy with ISIS. We don't have time to fight two fronts and everything. We're not ready. Don't retaliate. Wait till later. As soon as the Pope says, I can do it, I'll go to war. Yep. That's what it comes down to. They are the Vatican's puppets. Because why? He's a Sunni. And the Sunnis is the ones that are loyal to Rome. So anyway, the prince that shall come is of the people that destroyed the city and the sanctuary. So now, what do we find out though? Of course, uh, um, I get the names mixed up. Assad, Adad, Adad. I can't get my brain to work on that. Um, I went right, the one that came that got thrown out. Esau's descendant, Hadad. Thank you. I knew my brain would work in a minute. Anyway, Hadad, he goes into to, to Syria, and then later, according to the Jewish uh, rabbis that would trace the lineage of Esau, said that they moved into northern Africa, and then they go into Rome. And we know, according to God's word, according to Obadiah, God identifies Esau as the one that does what? He says, you went down and you stood as if you were one of them when my people, when you stood against your brother Jacob. God identifies in Obadiah that Esau is the one that stood against Jacob. And you stand as one of them and you were cons in consent as one of them when your people were, were destroyed. And they go into captivity. So God identifies Esau's descendants as the Romans, because Titus is the one that did it. So, and I don't have time to go to that because I don't, we just can't get to that part. Let's real quick look at Exodus 15, 1 as well. Again, we're looking at the Antichrist as a singular man, because here is the prince that shall come. And notice, he's not nowhere the prince that shall come, neither in chapter 9 nor chapter 11, where it speaks about him again. He's never called Mashiach. The Mashiach is cut off. But why is he called a prince? Because he's Antichristo. He is a substitute. He is like Christ. But he's not the anointed Christ. So he's a prince, but he's not anointed. Okay? Now in Exodus 15, 1, it says here, Then, Mos uh, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord. For he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. I thought that God threw 600 of them into the sea. Why is the song only speaking of one? In Hebrew, we say, See? I will sing. That's just Moses singing. But they sing it together because they're singing of a prophetic event. This is one reason we know that Moshe must come back as one of the two witnesses because he's actually prophesying of his own singing of the, of the conquering of an individual, one individual, not horses. It doesn't say susim. It says horse, singular. And one rider, not plural. But yes, the 600 did go in, but now he's talking about that enterprise that's going to come. And so he sings about it. Okay, let's quickly move forward. And again, we look back, at, 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 and this was just a scripture for, for Daniel here. And, um, and I, I did the colors there. To, to, and the reason I did that, I want you to be able to see it. Let me, let me go up one more here. If you were to not read the red, it makes more sense. And the people shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. What people destroyed it? The Romans. And they always try to blame it on the Syrians. 
But remember, the book of Obadiah is the longest book in the Bible, one chapter. You read from verse 7 on, God identifies Esau the entire time, and it's totally nothing but the prophetic prophecy of the destruction of the city of, uh, of Jerusalem, and everything there is about it, and God puts all the blame on Esau. And he even differentiates between the fact that he is one of them. Who's the them? That's the Syrians. That's the armies that came to help do the dirty work. But God puts the blame on Esau. So that's why I say, look at the blue. And the people shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. What people? Titus, the Roman general and the Syrians that helped him do it. And of the prince that shall come. But the prince is in the future. So the prince that comes in the future must be what? A Roman. And he's the lineage of who? Esau. That's why the Bible says, I love Jacob and I hated Esau. God knew that they were coming and it was going to come to a showdown in the last days. Okay? And this here is the picture we took ourselves in Rome. Uh, and this is in the old ancient Roman city. <clears throat> this was put in commemoration of Titus' victory and triumph. And you're seeing the golden menorah being carried back in. And it was, and one man wrote me one day, and, and I know he meant well by what he said. He said, there was no Vatican for them to bring the treasures back to. No, there were catacombs, and the Vatican's on top of the catacombs. <laughs> and we have a rabbi from uh, northern Africa, back uh, late 1800s, early 1900s once, that actually was in Rome, in the catacombs, and was allowed to see the menorah. So we have an eyewitness that that's where it's at, that they have control of it. There's the pontiff boy with McDonald, Ronald McDonald. Uh, this is what I want to read to you as well. This is important because this is showing that the prince of uh, the church uh, that will come. Uh, it says, princes of the church, what is a cardinal? Put simply, a cardinal, and this is written by Matthew Bunsen, by the way. Uh, uh, that is, and I didn't put down the name of the magazine, but anyway, it's for it's one of the Catholic magazines. He says here, put simply, a cardinal is a priest or bishop who has been named by the Pope to what is known as the Sacred College of Cardinals, so called because of the body of, or college of church offic officials. Memberships bestows no heightened spiritual authority, but the cardinals have as it, uh, their two chief duties: assisting the Pope in the governing of the vast worldwide church, and above all, electing each uh, new pontiff. That's for their job. They just like the new pope. Whom they serve by ancient custom, they are called princes because their diplomatic status of their position gives them and also because the previous centuries many of the members belong to the great noble families of Europe. Today, most cardinals come from uh, truly humble origins. Well, um, but if you think about it, why would they call them princes? Because the prince or the king is my wife was showing you an all of her illustration there. He's yeah. considered to be God on earth. Right. So they're just the sons. They're in line to become the next God on earth. So that's why they're called princes. So he is the prince that shall come. Okay? Wow. Now, again, and this is just to break it down for you in Hebrew 15.1. I wanted you to look at, at this again. Asherah. Uh, we say Ladonai. It's actually God's divine name. Um, and then Kiga Kiga Oga Susler Kevo. That is, uh, uh, for he has triumphed gloriously over his horse. Sus being the, well, I need to point to you. This being the Sus, the horse. It's in the singular. Kevo, his rider. This little dagish over the top of this vav here makes it his, his rider. It's just one guy riding this horse. It has nothing to do anywhere here. About 600 horses on there. This is Asherah. The Aleph over here shows, I will sing. Is that correct, sis? I will sing. Asherah, yeah. Yes. By the way, Yom Suf, Yom Suf is also, if you change your vowels, is Yom Suf, which you know what that is. The last days. Yom Suf. Yom Suf. Yom Suf. Yes. Yom Suf. Yes. Oh, yes. Amen. I did not know that, sis. <laughs> Amen. Wow. Praise yes. God. I got my learning Yom lesson Suf. tonight already. Praise the <laughs> Lord. Yom Suf, which is, Yom is singular, but it's last day. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We are in the last days. Amen. Uh, and quickly, Obadiah, as I said, how are the things of Esau searched out? Uh, that's in verse 6. How are his hidden things sought up? Um, 
Verse 8, shall I not at that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? Okay, in verse 10, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. As you see the burning of the, uh, of the city of Jerusalem and the temple there, and the temple treasures being taken out. Um, and in, the, in that day they stood us on the other side of the day that the strangers carried away the captives of his forces, etc. As I mentioned to you already, I'm going to quickly go through this because I want to get to another part here. Uh, okay, let me back up. This is where it's getting important. And this is where I'll close out is on these here. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of the, that did escape. That's because they, they, you know, they, they didn't let the Jews get nowhere. Even when they went to Masada, the Romans went down there and built it. They, they just killed anybody and everybody they could. Just, you know, and, the, and, the, and the Rome has never changed in the last 2,000 years. They've still been killing the Jews as much as they can. And I'll tell you what, I've got many Jewish friends that know that I'm a believer in Yeshua, but they will sit with me privately, and they have told me many, many times, Stephen, you know we cannot trust them. That's sad. You know, Christians. And, but yet, there's many of them that know that there are true believers in Yeshua that love them. But it's the fear they have of the ecclesiastical authority that wants to pass laws. Just like they're going through right now. The whole world, the ecumenical movement is against our people. And they're trying to destroy our nation and to take it and to put us on a little eight mile stretch of land so they can drive us into the sea. Yeah. Do they think we're all Catholics? Unfortunately, many Jewish people, now they know you're not all Catholics, but many Jewish people assume that Christianity is... Catholicism, and, 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 and that's sad, and we, and we are trying to get our people to realize that's not the case, but there's still a danger because we're facing annihilation because of the pressure of Rome and the politics around the world, even now as we speak. Um, let me go to verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen or, or, or nations. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon their, thy own head. That's where God is wanting to stand up for Israel. He doesn't stand up for us at the very beginning. Psalm 83, we, we never see. People call it the Psalm 83 war. We don't see God fight for us in this war in the beginning. Because we're saying, keep thou not silent, O God. That's showing that our plea, they've already raised up their head. They've got their leader, the viper. He's their leader. They've raised up their head. They're confederate together. The nations and everyone, even the churches, are confederate as one with them, and it calls them again Esau. It even says they've consulted against thy hidden ones. That's your two witnesses. Chuck Missler, I'll never forget him asking me when I first met him for the first time. He said, Stephen, do you think that that's the raptured saints? I sent him a letter, because I didn't know the answer at the time, and I sent him a letter right after that. I said, Chuck, it's not the raptured saints. If they were raptured already and gone, what do you need to consult against them for? They're not coming back. I said, but the ones that are hidden that are coming back are his two witnesses. And so they're trying to figure out what to do. So they need two false witnesses like they did with Yeshua 2,000 years ago. And it's going to be a showdown. And it's going to be a miraculous miracles from both sides. But one will stand on the word, the other won't. Now, quickly. This release will extend time because I don't, I, I just, I've got to make sure we get this in. Here's the important part. And this is what you're going to see that I didn't know before. I already knew part of this, but I didn't know all of this. Obadiah 1.16, For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. See? There he is. In the upper room above King David's tomb. Remember, when Pope Benedict was Pope, he's still Pope, by the way. Until a Pope is dead, he's still Pope. So you have two Popes, you have two false witnesses right there. Oh, wow. You already have two. They're here. They both live in Vatican City. And they told us when we were there, the, the, the Catholic guy, that, you, you know, they're both Popes. It's never happened in history before. Okay? So they're both there. And, but it says here, 
Here he is, he's, he's there above King David's tomb. A week later, and every week after that, they still kept holding communion services, but the next time around they did it, they came and they threw all the Jewish people out of the tomb of David so they could hold their mass celebration inside the tomb of David. The, the Israeli government gave a seat to Pope Benedict for all the popes, a, a seat, official seat at the tomb of David, and this is why the scripture speaks of a Jewish See, people say, oh, Dr. Antichrist is supposed to be Jewish. He is. Anytime you give the Pope of Rome a seat at the tomb of David, you're giving him, David was the king of Israel. Is that right? The son of David, Yeshua, is the king of Israel. But Yeshua will not have his seat on top of the grave site, but a dead false Messiah will have his seat on top of a tomb. So he is a dead antichrist. And he's got he's showing that he's he's showing that he is the prince by having the seat there. That's what makes him the Jewish part. Now, here's what's important. So they do that, but here's the part you gotta know. Let's look at what it says in Hebrew. Tika Asher Shutetem. Is that what I said right? Shutetem? Shutetem. Shutetem. Get a dyslexic God speaking Hebrew. I can read backwards really good, but I'll tell you what. Let's take a look at that. Quick, get under here. And this is where we can close. All right, right here. This is Shutetan. I'll get Shutetan. I can't even do it with the vowels. Okay, this here is speaking that he's going to drink. See? For that he shall drink, but here's what's interesting. It is in the past tense, masculine, plural. Okay? okay. May not make much sense to you. But that day, when he came, there was only one woman in the room. And she did not partake of the communion. It was only men. And you're going to see that in just a second. I'm going to show you. Okay, the next part of it. Alcha kodeshe kodeshe ishote shatu. See? And they shall continually drink. Now we're in the plural. They. They will drink, but it's also gender inclusive. Men and women. So after the first communion that was done in the upper room, the next time they did it, both men and women were partaking in the part of the communion mass. So see, the, it was prophetically written to you already. God was showing you that the first time that they're going to do it, it's going to be men only doing it. And then he says in the next one, and they'll continue to do it, but this time it's going to be gender inclusive. All right? Now, I want you to see what happened. Okay. Celebrate a mass before the men and women that will look after the holy places that took place at the cynical of the upper room. You can see what he's saying there. But what he's going to say next is what's important. This is where he's going to tell you who partook. Now, he's going to say in a second, you can't hear it on the volume on this end here, but what he's going to tell them is that the only ones that partook in, the, in this particular uh, service were the, his delegation that came with him and the monks that were present there. No one else. That's how we know it was only men that were involved in that particular uh, service. And... As I would say, and, and we will close now, the Pope of Rome is fulfilling scripture left and right. He does look like a nice guy. And if you just look at the outward things, this is why we catch a lot of flight for what we're saying. You know, 
I get it all the time. You know, he's a godly man. He's doing this. He's doing that and everything. Well, he's coming to the United States this year. And by the way, all these things are going to happen. A lot of things are happening in September. And God has given us, I wasn't even thinking about this until Brother Kellen Davison of David Star Magazine, he sent me a little email the other day and he told me, he says, do you realize, Brother Stephen, he says, you're given a platform in Jerusalem on the, sixth, from the 16th and 18th, I'm speaking at a conference there that he put together, that we have like about a dozen speakers that will be speaking there, including Orthodox Jewish rabbis will be speaking as well. He says, but you're given a platform to speak against the Vatican and what the Antichrist is doing. He said only a week before they will unleash hell against Israel. He said you will actually be given the voice. And I said, will, you, will I have liberty to speak what's on my heart? He said, you have the liberty to speak what's on your heart. He says, because the world will see then. He says, this is the one chance we have a voice to speak against what Rome is doing. And that will actually take place. It'll be it'll be in uh, Jerusalem. It'll be live filmed across the world. I'll be there. Amen. And anybody, you're welcome to come. We'd love for you to come. Um, and um, uh, it is a it is a conference that is against the anti-Semitism in the church that Brother David is doing. Um, but let me just uh, say this here: the Pope of Rome will be coming to the United States to speak to the both houses of Congress. In the United Nations. Never, that's right, never been done. I believe that we may very well see the beginning of Daniel's 70th week beginning at this moment here. Yes. Okay? I do believe, by the way, that Israel has already been divided. I know that from people that I know there, one of the top guys in the United Nations that I was actually living in a place that he has, asked me, are you coming to stay in Israel or are you coming to stay in the Golan? I said, what's the difference? It's already been divided. This is why the infrastructure has been being built. This is why Netanyahu, under the pressure he's under, and I feel for him, I really do feel for the man that he's under the pressure he's under. Because I believe in his heart, he doesn't want to divide the land. That's right. But he's being forced. He's looking for Mashiach to deliver us from the problems we're in. And it's only the Mashiach going to do it. Because we don't have a king that will. That's why it says in Micah, the fourth chapter, where is your king? God is challenging us with a question, where is your king? Because we rejected him. When we rejected Samuel being the prophet, and Israel wanted a king, God is asking the question, where is your king? And then God says the other fatal question to us. Is there no prince in thee? Isaiah 9, 6. He was called counselors. The prince of God. He's the prince. What happened to our counselor? Where is he at? God's making us wake up to where we went wrong. God bless you. We'll take about just a little quick, quick minute break for the message for you to take